to component number three. We've been through hardware, we've been through operating systems, and now to round out the big picture of a functional computer system, we have software. This is actually the useful stuff. Now, we've been working an awful long time with things that supposedly aren't useful, and that's why I kind of use this term kind of carefully. Operating systems are absolutely critical, and they do do a lot of useful things like managing our files. But software is the stuff we typically think of as doing the things we like to do. Software is also generally going to do something specific for the user, such as send and receive email or track finances or something like that. Software can also be a suite of many different programs bundled together. For example, Microsoft Office is software, but it's not one software program. It's a package of multiple programs. Different versions of Office exist, but basically the Microsoft Office suite includes things like Access, Excel, Word, PowerPoint, and Outlook. So those are five separate software programs that are bundled together. One of the nice features of using a suite of software products is that they are built or intended to work together. Now a lot of times people don't do this, and I'll give you an example. Sometimes, especially in government, a lot of government agencies started using an email program called Lotus Notes or GroupWise, both very fine products. Then they wanted to use Microsoft Word, and it's not that they can't. But the fact is that if you use Exchange and Outlook for email, instead of one of those other products, it is intended to work together with Word. So you can do some very nice things, such as send an email directly from within Word without having to close Word and open a different piece of software. See what I mean? And it's not that I'm trying to promote one particular program over another. There are a lot of different suites out there. For example, there's the Corel WordPerfect suite that has many things in common as well. Just remember that if there is a suite of programs that they are designed to go together, and sometimes it can both offer you a functionality benefit, as well as being a little less expensive than buying a bunch of separate programs. Also remember that each program can be very simple, or it can be extensive. We've taken a look at the calculator, and the calculator, at least the first ones that came out, were very simple. It had the four basic functions of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and allowed you to enter digits. The calculator that now comes with Windows has been expanded, so now we have a scientific calculator. It will do different kinds of conversions, for example, between metric and U.S. measurements and those types of things. The calculator, though, is still a fairly simple program, as far as programs go. There are a lot of programs that are much more extensive. For example, there are some web programs that allow you to not only manage web pages, but entire web sites. It will track the content that's uploaded. It will track versioning, who changes things, when, and where it goes. And there's even approval that not all content is perfectly seen the first time until it's actually approved by somebody. So as you can see, all of these different pieces of software can have a variety of different functions. They can be standalone programs or part of a suite. And each program can also be very simple or very extensive and complex. But they all still fall into the software category. Don't forget that software can also be called a program or an application. All three of these will be used interchangeably. What makes software work is that software contains some kind of programming in the background. Now, we're in a computer fundamentals class, so we certainly don't want to get into the different types of programming languages there are. But just know that that means that there are instructions that are used by the computer to complete certain tasks. If you want to send an email, you have to have something that understands what you're typing on the screen, can take that information, do all of the magic conversions that it needs to to zap it across the virtual airwaves to the recipient, have it put back together, and appear to them as the same words, sentences, and paragraphs that you typed. If you think about that, that's really phenomenal, and that's why I get excited about software and really all of technology, because what we can do with it is really a phenomenal thing. By pressing a button, in just a few seconds, we can zap a message around the world and have it appear miraculously on somebody else's computer. That's cool. You also need to remember that some software may come preloaded on your computer, and others you need to purchase and install yourself. We've been working with some of the preloaded software that actually comes bundled together with the Windows operating system. Things like Notepad, WordPad, Calculator, and Paint. They are software. They're technically not the same as the Windows operating system, but they do come bundled with the operating system so that you have some functionality without having to purchase anything on your own. 
I'm sure that once you get going though on your computer that you'll be purchasing some of your own software. That could be something like a game that you want to play. It also could be some productivity software like spreadsheets, word processing documents. Or maybe you're going to go full-fledged out into multimedia and you want to get things that will allow you to burn and rip your own CDs or DVDs or maybe even make movies. All of these are examples of software that you can purchase and install. Remember that regardless of which program it is you're using, there are several ways that you're going to launch them on a PC. There may be an icon or a shortcut found on the desktop. You also may find it in the Start menu. If it's not in the Start menu, from the Start menu, you can also go to All Programs and find it there. If you're using Windows Vista, or if you're using Windows 7, and even Windows XP, you may have the Quick Launch bar next to the Start button that allows you to have quick access to frequently used programs. And then you also may find them in an actual folder on the computer system itself, but that's probably going to be your last choice. And don't forget that with Vista and Windows 7, you also can search very quickly. If you know all or part of the name, just start typing and it will locate it for you. The actual file that launches a program usually ends in .exe. That's called an executable. An executable represents a program. What you need to know, though, is that most programs are not just that single file. They could be one or ten or even hundreds or thousands of different files. As an example, Microsoft Office, when it's installed, is installed to its own folder in your Program Files folder. That goes on your hard drive. Now, I don't want you to memorize all of this, but just know that within the Microsoft Office folder, there are many, many different subfolders with literally hundreds of individual files. But it's the executable file that launches a program. For example, WinWord, W-I-N-W-O-R-D dot E-X-E, is the single file that launches Microsoft Word. So if you ever see something that ends in dot E-X-E, you'll know that that's some type of a program. You can click on it if you know what it is, but you also need to be careful. If you ever receive an E-X-E file in email and you don't know why you have it or who sent it to you, don't click on it, because that could be something malicious like a virus or something that's going to damage your computer. So once we know there's all of the software around, it kind of helps us to be able to put it into categories because there's an awful lot of it out there. Categories are based on the common function, type, or field of use. For example, we can have system software. These are little programs that are used to monitor and manage computer files or networks. If you work in a business, your IT person will be very familiar with system software. They have all kinds of little gadgets and software that will allow them to monitor what's happening on the network. How much bandwidth is going on? Who's logged on to the network? Are there any computers that are problematic? Those types of things. So that's system type software. Something beyond what we're going to talk about is known as programming tools. These are things that you actually use to write computer programs. Visual Basic is a very common programming language, as is C Sharp, JavaScript, even HTML. These are all different programming languages. You also have compilers, which are what take all of the written instructions and put them together into a program that'll run. And a GUI editor, which is a graphical user interface editor, that allows you to edit things as well. Again, way beyond what we want to talk about, but just know that for all of the things that you see on your computer, somebody originally had to program it. And of course, there are software tools to allow them to do that. The one that we're probably most interested in right now is simply known as application software. This includes some subcategories. Word processors, spreadsheets, and presentation and email clients are all considered application software. This is where WordPerfect and the Microsoft Office Suite fit in. Microsoft Word is a word processor. Microsoft Excel is a spreadsheet. PowerPoint is a presentation program. Outlook, GroupWise, and Lotus Notes are all email clients. One of the things that I started with is actually a database, which is also application software. Now, sometimes databases can be very high-end, and they can go up into the other two categories. But for most of our purposes, anything that manages data is a database-type application. For example, Microsoft Access. Then we have some of the fun stuff, things like page layout programs and multimedia that work with audio, video, and animation. Microsoft Publisher, Adobe InDesign, or for those of you who may have been around quite a while, we have things like PageMaker. They're all page layout programs. And these days, there is literally a ton of multimedia software out there, both for amateurs or entry-level people, all the way up to the pros. 
In short, though, you can now see what some of the main software categories are. In order to be able to select a piece of software, you need to know what type of work you want it to do, what the features are, and then pick one that's going to be appropriate for your use. There can be nothing more frustrating than buying the wrong software. If you're a professional in graphics, you'll probably be frustrated with an entry-level multimedia program. Conversely, if you're brand new to it, and you open up something like some of the Adobe products, you'll probably be frustrated because they are so advanced and offer so many features that you probably won't know where to start. So it's all about making good choices. And believe me, there is software out there for everybody, for every use, at every level. Working within an application uses the basic interface components and skills we've already discussed, such as toolbars, the ribbon, and menus, as well as mouse and keyboard skills for moving, typing, and selecting. The specific methods and skills used within a specific application are something to be covered in a course on that application, but some universal skills are appropriate for us now. One of those is the process of saving files. Saving a files is the process of moving the file and its contents to storage as opposed to memory. Storage is intended to be persistent instead of volatile or permanent instead of temporary. When we first start working, let's say that we are typing something into WordPad, Notepad, or Microsoft Word. Until we actually save it, all of that information is just being held in RAM memory, which is temporary. If the computer were to go off all of a sudden, we might lose all of the work that we had. Fortunately, when we save a file, we're going to move that information to a permanent location, or at least a more persistent and stable place, instead of leaving it in that RAM memory where it's in a little bit of peril if something bad goes on. Regardless of the application, saving always requires three basic things. A location to which you're going to save, a file name for the specific file, and a file type. When you choose a location, you're going to choose a storage device. Now this could be the hard drive inside the CPU. It could be a USB drive that you put into a USB port on your computer. It could be a CD or DVD if they are burnable or recordable. It also could include things like a network drive or an external hard drive. But there has to be some type of physical hardware device to which you are storing the information. In addition, all of these different devices may have something called folders. So you need to choose the folder to which you want to save it as well. The file type is normally defined by the default for the program. For example, if I'm working in Microsoft Word, by default it wants to save it as a Microsoft Word file. But some programs allow you to save into different formats. Microsoft Word is one of those examples. I can save it as a Word file, or I can save it as something known as rich text, or even something called plain text. Rich text allows me to have things like colors and different fonts and bolding and bullet points. Plain text is just like a typewriter. Why would I want to save it to one of these other formats? Well, because I might have Microsoft Word, but not everybody in the world does. So to make it more accessible, or in other words, so I can share the file with other people, I might go ahead and save it as a rich text file. That means that most people, with some type of word processor that was created in the last oh, decade or so, will be able to read that file, and it also keeps it with all the interesting stuff. The bolding, italics, colors, and bullet points that make it interesting and easier to read. If I wanted to ensure that absolutely anybody with a computer could read it, then I would save it as plain text. Plain text does not support different fonts, it doesn't support features like making it bold or italics, and it doesn't support bullet points. It just has the ABCs and 123s and different symbols that you can type on a keyboard. But plain text can be read by virtually any computer. So even though I'm using a specific program, in this example Microsoft Word, there are three, and actually there's many more, different types of formats that I can save it into. When I save the file is when I will determine which type of format I want to save it into. When we go to save a file, though, there are certain rules that we have to follow about naming. First of all, names can be up to 255 characters long. But let me caution you a little bit. Please don't use all 255 characters. First of all, there are some technical reasons why you shouldn't do it, but for our purposes, it just makes things too long. Now, technically speaking, I could call something I created in WordPad, the file that I created while taking my course on personal computer fundamentals with Aaron Olson on 2010, 
whatever it is. That name is technically legal, but it's way too long. It gets to be cumbersome. But we also don't have to be short and cryptic like we did in the old days. When we had DOS, we had a limitation to how many characters we could have, and that meant we have to be kind of cryptic and abbreviate things. With 255 characters, you can be descriptive, but you don't want to go overboard. You also can include any type of alphanumerics, in other words, ABCs and 123s, and you can include some symbols. I recommend that you do not use symbols at all, but you definitely, on a Windows environment, can't use the slash, the backslash, the pipe, the colon, the asterisk, the question mark, the angle brackets, or a quotation mark. Those particular symbols have meanings to computers. So if you were to put it as part of a file name, the computer would get confused when it kind of put it in with all the rest of the information that it needs to process. So alphanumerics are fine. Symbols other than ones I've specifically listed here could be used, but I recommend that you just stick with ABCs and 123s, and that way you'll be sure that your file names are good on any computer system, even those that aren't your own. Technically speaking, file names can have spaces. Once again, though, I'm going to recommend that they do not. Now, I'm a little inconsistent. When I create folders, I do often put spaces in folders, but with file names, I tend to just keep them out. Since not having spaces can make it hard to read, I want to talk a little bit about using capital and lowercase letters. In Windows, it is case retentive, but not case sensitive. That means if you type certain letters in uppercase, it will remember them. For example, if I type my file with a capital M and a capital F, that's the way it will appear. So it is case retentive, but it is not case sensitive meaning if I ever went to search for a file called My File, I could type it in any way I want, in all uppercase letters, all lowercase letters, or mixed case. And regardless of how I typed it, Windows would be able to find the file. What we have to remember, though, is that we can't have different versions of it within the same location. In other words, I can't have My File with a capital M and a capital F, and My File in all lowercase in the same location if it's the same file type. All of those rules are kind of about the first name, and now I want to talk about the file name extension. Names have a three or four letter extension on the end of them. Depending on how your computer is set up, you may or may not always see this extension. This extension identifies something known as the authoring application. In other words, which program created it? Was it Notepad? Was it WordPad? Or was it Microsoft Word? The computer needs to know this because when you go to open the file, it needs to know which application it should use to open it. You should not change the last name. Now trust me, you have 255 characters for the first name. You really don't need to be messing with the last three or four letters. People that do that tend to have worked with computers in DOS, and in trying to get a few extra letters out of DOS, they would mess with the last name. We're not going to do that though, because if you mess with the last name, it confuses the computer. If I put a .erin at the end of every file I created so I could identify it as my own, and then I double clicked on it, the computer would go, huh, I have no idea what a .erin file is. Either it wouldn't be able to open it all, or every time I went to open the file, it would give me a little window that says, uh, I'm confused, I don't know what to open this with, can you please tell me which application I need? Trust me, that's way more work than it's worth. So as a review, we want to keep our file names simple but descriptive, so they're easy to identify by just looking at the name, but not too lengthy. We do not want to change the file name extension, the part that comes after the period. File names are really like our first and last names. The last name identifies us as part of a family. So if I'm in a whole group of people, and they're saying, uh, excuse me, but which family do you belong to? I can say, well, I'm an Olson, and that way they kind of know what family group to put me in. The same is true with computer files. When I have a .doc file, my computer knows that that's a Microsoft Word document. If I have a .xls file, it knows it belongs to Microsoft Excel and so forth. The first name, on the other hand, identifies us as an individual. So I may be an Olson, but I'm also an Aaron. Now we can have more than one person named Susan, for example, but usually not in the same family. 
The reason I bring this up is because I can have a Word document called Budget 2010, and I can also have an Excel document called Budget 2010. Even though they both have the same first name, Budget 2010, the computer knows that one is a Word file and one is an Excel file because of the extension. One ends in .doc and one ends in .xls. So on a PC, we can have more than one file with the same file name, but it can't have the same first and last name and be in the same location. If it has the same first name, like my Budget 2010, but a different last name, then both of those can reside in the same location. It's the whole name being the same that can't be stored within the same location. In this case, we're talking When we want to save a file, we have to save it somewhere. As we said just a few moments ago, it has to be stored on some type of hardware. So let's take a few minutes to talk about storage and media. Remember that storage is not the same as memory. Memory is volatile, and storage is something that we call persistent. Storage can be something that is known as fixed or removable. Fixed is inside the CPU. For example, a hard drive is an example of a fixed drive because we can't take it out and move it. It's kind of like a library book that has to be used at the library because it can't be checked out. The other type that we have is known as removable media. And I think by the name you can understand that that's something that we can remove from either ports or drives on the computer and we can take it with us. A floppy disk, a CD or DVD, a USB thumb drive or an external hard drive are examples of removable media. Now some of you may be saying, well wait a second, I can't take the CD drive out of my CPU. No, you can't take the drive out, but you can take the media, in other words the CD itself. That's what makes it removable. These days, we also have some that are all-inclusive. For example, an external hard drive. That's a piece of hardware, and it in itself is removable. We don't take media out of it. It is both the hardware and the media all in one. Now, I know sometimes when you're talking to people or you're reading things, it gets kind of confusing about all of these giga, mega, tera things that we hear about, what's a bit and what's a byte. We're not going to get into all of the details because that's a fairly technical discussion. But just remember that computers measure things using the One that you will hear an awful lot of is something called a byte. A byte is simply a unit of storage on a computer. A byte in itself is really too small, so usually we see it with some kind of metric prefix associated with it. Kilobytes these days are usually the smallest unit that we see. In short, a byte is the amount of storage it takes to hold one character. In other words, the letter A takes up a byte. See, I told you that's probably way too detailed for what you want to know. But let's talk about some of the prefixes. I believe when I was a kid, there was this push that the United States was going to go to the metric system. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly how old I am, but I think I was in about second grade, and now I'm far beyond second grade, and I don't think that has happened. But still, in a lot of scientific and technology arenas, we use the metric prefixes. So just as a review of something you probably haven't heard since you were in school, a kilo, or a lowercase k, means a thousand, mega, with a capital M, is a million, giga, with a capital G, is a billion, with a B, and tera, which you will start hearing more and more of, is one trillion. So these are the prefixes that we can put in front of bytes. We can have kilobytes, kb, megabytes, mb, gigabytes, gb, and terabytes, TB. Often you will have files, for example, a small word processing document that could be in kilobytes, maybe 64 KB. If you're working with any kind of pictures, audio, or video, they're probably going to be in megabytes. Your hard drive, however, is probably now measured in gigabytes. For example, I have a 250 gigabyte hard drive. And we're already beginning to see some hard drives and some external devices that measure things in terabytes, which is a lot of space. So again, you don't need to remember about exactly how to calculate the math involved with this. Just know the range that they work in. Kilo, mega, giga, tera, and that each one is bigger than the other significantly. With this information, you'll now be able to save your files to the appropriate location with good names and also know about how much space you have on your media, such as your hard drive. I am not at all worried about having enough hard drive space in order to save the little text file I'm about to create as a demo. 
but I do want to show you where you can find your file size. So for just a second, I'm going to move on my desktop over to the My Computer System icon, and I'm going to give that a double click. That opens it up and shows me all of the drives that are available on this computer. We're not going to worry too much about all the details here, but I just want you to take a look at my C drive, which is the hard drive sitting in my CPU. It has this nice little kind of bar that shows me that I currently have a 31.9 gigabyte hard drive and I currently have 20.3 gigabytes that are free. And if I look at the little bar, I can see that I haven't even come close to half, maybe closer uh, between a quarter and a third of my hard drive is full. So that's good news. This is a fast way to always check and see how big your hard drive is, as well as how much space is available. And you can do that really with any of the drives that are available in your computer. For now though, let's just go ahead and close this window out. And let's get on to creating a simple little text file so we can go through the save process. I'm going to go to my Start button, and I'm going to select WordPad, or if you prefer, you can type WordPad, and we'll get that launched. Now, just because I can, I'm going to go ahead and maximize this. WordPad is a simple word processor, and this isn't a typing class, but I do need to type something that I can then save as a file. So I'm going to get very creative with you here, and I'm going to type, this is a file I can save. Now I know, not very exciting, but that's really not the purpose of what we're doing. We simply want to save the file. So what do I need to do now? If I was to actually click on the close button or to use the file menu to exit out of the application, you should always be assured that in any application that I know of, if you have not saved the file or if you have made changes to the file since it was last saved, you will always be prompted. In other words, a computer application will not allow you to simply close something without giving you the opportunity to save it. That should make you feel a little bit at ease. If I were to click on the red X to close the window, it would come up and say, do you want to save your file? And I could say yes. But we want to go through more of a formal process. So instead, I'm going to move over to the left side of my screen, and I'm going to click the little down button to the left of the Home tab, which is the equivalent of my File menu. One of the options here is Save, but I also want you to see that another option is Save As. When you have two options, the question often is, well, what's the difference between the two? The very first time you save a file, you really don't have an option. Whether you click Save or Save As, it's always going to bring up the Save As dialog box. That's because the first time you save a file, you have to tell the computer all three of those pieces of information we talked about. What location do you want it saved to? What is the file name going to be? and what is the file type, or the last name, or the file extension that you want. So, since this is a new file, regardless of which one I chose, it actually is going to go to the Save As command. Now, after you have saved a file, then these two things do different things. Once it's been saved the first time, if I then just click Save, I'm not prompted for anything. Save will automatically save it to the same location with the same name as the same file type as when it was last saved. That's probably going to be what you'll do most often as you open up and edit documents. I can also, however, use the Save As command after I've saved it the first time. If I want to save it to a different location, or if I want to give it a different name, or if I want to save it as a different type of file, all three of those or any combination will be available using the Save As command after a file has been initially saved. Well, just to prove my point, we haven't saved this one yet, so I'm going to click the Save option and show you that the Save As dialog box is what comes up. In a later chapter, we'll talk about folders and folder structure and those types of things. But for now, know that every application is going to come up in what's known as a default directory or a default folder. For Windows 7, it happens to be something called Libraries. And in Libraries, there is a special place just for documents, as opposed to music, pictures, and videos. On older operating systems, for example on Windows Vista, it will probably just open to Documents, which are the documents for the current user. And on Windows XP, it probably goes to My Documents. 
That default location can be changed, but that's something that you learn in each specific application because each application does it a little bit differently. What we're going to do is we're simply going to stay in this default location, which is in the Documents folder inside of our libraries. The next step will be, now that I've chosen location, is to give it a file name. And you'll see that by default, this window opens up with document already highlighted. Now trust me, you do not want to save your documents with names like document1, document2, document3. That doesn't mean anything. So this is where our naming conventions come in. I'm going to give this, again, a very unique name. I'm going to call it Sample Saved Document. And then I'm going to put a question mark after it. Now the reason I'm putting the question mark after it is because the question mark is one of those forbidden symbols. I told you you can't actually use a question mark as part of a file name. And I just wanted to kind of show you that that's true. Before I do that, though, I want to talk a little bit about the file type. We can see that in WordPad, the default format or the default file type is known as Rich Text Format, or RTF. RTF is the three-letter extension. But I also have a drop-down. If I click on the drop-down arrow, I can see that I do have options. I can save this as an Office Open XML document, Open Document Text, a plain text document, a text document in MS-DOS format, or a Unicode text document. Here's a little hint for you. If you don't know what these different things are, then you probably shouldn't be saving to them. And most often, you're probably going to want to just keep the default. For our purposes, I am going to keep it as just an RTF file. So I can either click on that, or I could have also just pressed Escape to get out of it. I did want to show you, though, that if you choose a different format that is not the default, for example, a text document, some of your applications will give you the option in the Save As dialog box to say, you know what, I want this to always be the default format anytime I create a document in this particular application. In other words, I can change the default for WordPad documents to always save as a plain text document. That's not what I want to do, so I'm going to go ahead and move it back. Now I'm going to click on the Save button, and I want you to watch what happens. Well, first of all, if I click on Save, nothing happens. Now the reason is, in this particular application, as soon as I change the file type, it erased the name. So just as a best practice, I always recommend that when you're saving under different file types, that you set the file type first, and then type your name. Not all applications will do this, but it's the best habit, and then it always works. So I'm going to go ahead and type again, and this time I'll call it Sample Saved Document. With my question mark. And once again, I'm going to try to click on the Save button. This time you notice that the box is still open, and it highlighted my file name. WordPad is a fairly basic or simple application, so it doesn't give me much feedback. But what it's telling me is it doesn't like the file name. We know that that's because I have that question mark in there, and that's not allowed. Many other applications will actually come up with a little message window that says, you have used an inappropriate character. It'll tell you exactly what it doesn't like. I'm going to press my backspace key to get rid of the question mark. Now I'll click Save. And guess what? Now the dialog box closes, and I can see that it has been saved. I know because if I look up at the title bar at the very top of my screen, it no longer says document, it says sample save document. This is perfect. Remember I promised you if you make a change that you'll be prompted before you close the file. So now I will make a change. And let's pretend that I forgot to save the file. Now I can go back up to the upper right-hand corner of my screen, click on the red X, and WordPad is nice enough to say, oh, wait a second, you've made changes. Do you want to save your changes? And here we can actually see the full path. Sample save document dot RTF, there's our last name. And in this case, I can say, yes, please do save the changes. That closes the file and the application and takes me back to the desktop. 
Now remember, if I would have done File Save As after I saved it the first time, the same dialog box would have opened, giving me the opportunity to change the location or the name or the file type. If I would have simply clicked Save, I wouldn't have seen anything happen, but I can be assured that the file has been saved with the latest greatest version.